Welcome everyone to um, podcast Dragons, Gazelles, and Unicorns. I'm Rosemary Truman, founder and CEO of the Center for Advanced Innovation. And I'm really thrilled today to have Laura Stein on, on, a, on, the, on the show today to provide some incredible insights and, valu and valuable journey notes. <laughs> she was the founder of TEDx and now has a new enterprise called Boma Global. I'm going to hand it over to you, uh, Laura, to give us a little bit of background on what you're doing now and how you got to where you are. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so, yeah, big question. Um, so I'm South African. I was born in a small town called Benoni, which is just outside of Johannesburg. And I grew, grew up in South Africa during apartheid. And so my early informative years were spent in South Africa and I moved to America when I was 17 for college and landed up staying on. So I think a lot of what informs how, what I've done in my life and how I think can definitely be traced back to growing up in apartheid South Africa and really seeing how often systems are optimized to bring, bring great pain and suffering. And what I always revert back to, whether it's on a micro or macro level, is you know why is something designed the way it is? Or why does a system exist um, in that way? And why can't it be imagined as something other? And um, so yeah, my background is I've worked for a lot of big for-profit companies. I've rolled up internet startups and strategy companies and taken them public and then you know, after I had my children, I really wanted to align behind, I wanted my work to align behind my value system. And, and, and I felt if I was going to go to work, um, I had twins, um, they were little, and I wanted to be doing something that felt meaningful to me. And that's when I made a transition to working for a nonprofit. Um, I worked on uh, the TED, the TED, a TED Prize at TED and then stayed on and um, founded TEDx. And so, and my journey has been sort of an evolution from there to build on how do we use um, communities to balance purpose and profit and how do we create, um, get away from sort of this, um, you know, value system we have, which is only maximizing for shareholder value and move to one that is multi-stakeholder and that balances profit and purpose. And so a lot of the work I've done over the last 15 years has been aligned around how do we change this sort of really polarized system to one where it's more of an inclusive collaborative system. And, and when you say polarized system, could you give us a little bit more detail? Or what do you mean by that? Well, I think our whole um, legal governance, all our structures right now are set up in a way that you're either working in a for-profit organization, mm -hmm. but for the most part, um, with the exception of a few, um, are, 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 um, their responsibility, um, fiduciary responsibility, is to maximize for shareholder value. Mm -hmm. And then you have your non-profits that are, um, you know, doing a lot of good work in the world but um you know are either in constant fundraising mode yeah. or and aren't always the most collaborative as a result because they're fighting over the same pot of money and if you try to in any way combine that strategy legally it's they make it very difficult for you so you're either in the one bucket or in the other bucket and i think a lot of people are working through how do we create a, a um a model that where you can deliver both profit and purpose and something that's good for you know your shareholders your employees um your communities the environment and other stakeholders in your ecosystem so was tedx when you launched tedx was that the first step towards creating such, such a an integration well, not really. I mean, TEDx was a non-profit model. Mm -hmm. right? um, it was an amazing platform for inspiration, but the um, license was a free license and the volunteers, you know, built their TEDx's um, as volunteers. Mm -hmm. And there was really no way for them to drive revenue off their TEDx events. Mm -hmm. So it was very much in the non-profit um, okay. world. And so... 
from TEDx, I stepped back and I was, I was asked to come to Singularity University to um, build out their global expansion. I guess what was interesting at that moment for me is, could I use that platform as a platform to, um, you know, expand and evolve this thinking because they were an impactful organization. Um, they said they were a B Corp and they were trying to drive people who were um, deeply engaged, mainly US based, and in a decentralized way, use them to generate revenue to help support some of the impact and mm -hmm. community work we wanted to do. Um, and so I, I built a lot of that framework and I started experimenting further with a lot of um, what has now become um, my new company, BOMA, which is this decentralized network of partners around the world that are thinking about how do we um, intentionally and intelligently design a more human-centered and um, you know, cross-stakeholder future. And so, um, you know, I think a lot of what we are working on in BOMA right now, you know, two months ago, pre-COVID, um, we had a very much in-person engagement strategy around how do we do two things, take some of these big global challenges that need deeply local inputs in an agile way, um, have these global discussions and we're doing these through um, large scale impact events and working with this to um, work, work in a world that is changed, a more intelligent future that is fair, that is sustainable, that has gender equality um, inside of it, that is really thinking about what that next generation of young people want in order to make their workplace meaningful. And so a lot of our work was working in person inside companies um, on these learning journeys. Since you know, COVID-19 hit, we've really pivoted pretty radically and we're now taking everything digital. And so that's been an interesting challenge for myself and I have now nine um, country partners around the world and country teams that are working on this as well as community teams. We launched our community initiative in Paris in January in person. And so we're moving all that um, into the digital space. So, so could you elaborate on the community initiatives versus the initiatives that you have within large companies that we have these nine country leaders that are in, uh, engaging with large companies to help them yeah. solve big problems. Yeah. So, well, we have right now we have, you know, in a, in a COVID, in a COVID environment, as I say, we've, we've done a pretty radical pivot. We have um, two pillars of our organization um, for now. One is our public facing events. And we started off two weeks after everything was shut down in the U.S. We did a what we, we did a round the world summit, which was two to our segments actually in eleven countries around what we could all learn from each other. Because for example, our Chinese team was already eight weeks into it and far ahead of us, and a lot mm -hmm. of the learnings, everything from how the educational system had been disrupted to some of the research going on, um, and so we did this round the world summit, and we had Zoom and Facebook. We had some amazing partnerships. Within three weeks, we did a second one on mental health. And by then, sort of everybody had their online offering and it was a very noisy, very crowded space. Mm -hmm. So we then launched what we're calling our BOMA Studio, where each of our country partners now are working on um, the thought leaders and educators in their local communities around some of the big challenges um, that, that um, the COVID um, epidemic has sort of surfaced. And, we're doing themed weeks. So, for example, we have this online studio that all of our country partners are hosting segments around the future of education, innovation and breakthroughs in a COVID world. Um, we're doing on remote health and we do and mental health. Um, obviously, remote and mental health has been massively d disruptive. Mm. Um, and, you know, the manufacturing and supply chains is another piece that's been disrupted by COVID. And so we're using our BOMA studio to do this 360 around the world to like highlight how different um, countries and different um, you know, sectors are thinking about it. Mm -hmm. And so that's our public facing initiatives we're doing. We're partnering with big media organizations in each of those countries to help amplify. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's just on a court scripts where we're doing, where they partnering with us on one of the, the innovation piece of one of the segments we're doing. Um, 
sorry, I'm in a co-working space with my kids and somebody's playing classical music. <laughs> <laughs> this is the COVID world, right? <laughs> um, so, so that's on the public facing, um, how do we take some of these big challenges and COVID is an example of how we have huge global challenges right now, but we need agile local inputs and innovations to be, to bubble up to and create these global solutions. And so BOMA was optimized to take on some of these conversations. The second piece, we've pivoted all our corporate training into the online space. So we now have a digital platform where we, we are offering corporate training in, um, and learning inside of um, organizations around uh, leadership in a time of crisis, you know, courage in a time of crisis, and how do, how do we need, what do we need to be doing, and how do we need to be thinking, who do we need to be, and what do we need to know to lead in a moment like this. And mm -hmm. so a lot of our corporate training work is around that right now, and then we're pivoting to bring some of our other programs online that talk more to, you know, inclusive work environments, transparent work environments, gender equality, and then, of course, sustainability with, with, within your organization. And so over the next, I'd say, six months, we're going to be pivoting to bring all that online and, you know, for the foreseeable future, because I don't really, our business model has to be based on that right now, because I don't, I, I don't have a crystal ball and I don't think any CEO does right now mm -hmm. um, that they can look into to say, this is when people are going to feel comfortable getting back together in person to convene, right? Mm -hmm. And you see a lot of a sh lot, lot of shift going on right now with some of our biggest companies right now saying, they have absolutely no plans to ask any of the employees to go back into the workplace, mm -hmm. right? And so that creates a very different model for um, upskilling or learning or training. And for us, we look at it as an opportunity mm -hmm. because we, um, you know, we have this decentralized model and, you know, we are able to move quickly. And I think it's also created a space where it's opened up people in a new way to think about a system COVID sort of brought out all the failures of our, our environment, right? Yeah. Uh, and our, um, our political system and um, our healthcare system. And so it's given everybody a moment to pause to say, well, if we were to design something better, what would it look like? And, mm -hmm. how, and how, and in some cases, it's forced us to think about it. In the case of education, it's the one thing that had not been disrupted. Mm -hmm. And now you've seen where, you know, two months ago, you couldn't have had that conversation with the unions in York about moving things online. Within two weeks, everything had moved online, right? Mm -hmm. And that's a massive disruption. Mm -hmm. But then the question becomes, well, A, what are the best practices? Because I can tell mm -hmm. you, having three kids, my kids are burnt out from Zoom and they really, <laughs> really are craving some in-person connections. <laughs> yeah. So what are the best practices and how do we leverage technology at the other, on the other side of this to create an intelligent hybrid model for learning, right? And what does that look like? And same with the scientific community, you know, it's amazing. It's disrupted how scientists were willing to collaborate. They have this big collaborative platform now as breakthroughs happen. Um, they, it's elevated across the scientific community that would have been unheard of for the most part, right? A few months ago. And so, do we continue, do scientists continue this radical collaboration on the other side of this, or do we revert back to a bunch of lawyers deciding what they can and can't do, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think all of these are big conversations and it's a moment in time where we can have them. And I feel fortunate to be um, heading up a company that's able to be at the forefront of you know, having some of these conversations and driving the action piece. Because that's kind of what BOEM is all about, is, is identifying the big, questions or issues that need to be solved and then convening the community and the thought leaders and the big companies and um, to, to solve these problems and then creating kind of a path to learn about how to solve them most effectively by leveraging our global network. Is that about right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, you know, it's a sort of, it's a structure that's both top down and bottom, and bottom up and multi-stakeholder. So, mm -hmm. You know, in order for change to happen, you have to bring different sectors along with you. And that part of the learning journey is important. Otherwise, it's very hard to make change happen. So when you, when you, when you bring together all these, you know, the, these themes in each of the weeks and the different countries are, are convening their community, their thought leaders, the different stakeholder groups together and identifying what best practices have already been tried and 
are successful and what new ones could be deployed. Are you cultivating kind of like a database of best practices across the different countries so that they can be shared even more broadly with when, when you start the new BOMA communities in other countries? Well, I wouldn't say we're doing all of it, but I'll give you an example. We're collaborating right now with a educator who has a big community of um, people in, in, in education who is jump starting and we're partnering with them on an initiative to bring sort of this multi-stakeholder approach. Um, and the first convening is going to be curating sort of some of the best practices in the education space where each of these teachers sort of throw out a three minute sort of mini talk on what they're doing that mm -hmm. is a best practice, right? And so we will, you know, in, that's an example of, yes, we will, you know, um, aggregate what we learn there in a way and share it, most certainly. And, you know, when, when this COVID, COVID thing happened, you know, I guess we couldn't foresee, it was hard to foresee all the different areas that, that were going to be disruptive. We could, we kind of say, these are the categories for sure. But then uh, it, it became evident every day that we had new surprises, right? Um, how did you come up with your themes uh, to, to work on each week? So I have a global community with, and I'm constantly getting multiple inputs. So most certainly I listen to my part with really sort of lived in that future space. And so when, you know, COVID surfaced, I was sort of listening to a lot of different voices to say, where, where are the big pockets of disruption? And some of them were completely obvious, right? Mm -hmm. There's certainly, um, you know, you know, education is one that yeah. everybody's watching in awe with how it's shifted in the last few months. And what does that even mean? Um, I have two kids that I'm interviewing to college in September, right? And I'm watching, <laughs> you know. What's gonna um, happen? Really this thing happen? Yeah, well, how the schools are communicating differently, I too, and 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 you know where this is all going to land up, right? Mm -hmm. And so, so you know, some of the the themes are really obvious. Um, you know, I think what's more interesting to me is um, what happens in a post-COVID world and mm -hmm. how much this carries through. And so, those are the harder um, topics to figure out, like you know. The, democratization of drug discovery based on mm -hmm. some of the lessons learned from COVID. How does, how does that work, right? And, and, and can we create a new system to allow for that? Um, and I know there are lots of people working on it, but can we do that successfully, right? And so what do we do with education on the other side of this? So how mm -hmm. does that move away from the, um, you know, pre-industrial, you know, turning kids out like widgets to a place where we're using smart AI to give my child the best experience without my without them feeling like they're being they're living in inside of a you know technological you know tunnel which I feel like they feel right now yeah. so you know putting the humanity back into it in a smart way and mm -hmm. um you know, and I think it's it's time for all the technology companies to think about what they put out in the world mm -hmm. in a way and say, how do we humanize it? How do we make technology serve the way we really want to live in this world rather than be dictated to by these, these technologies that we've been forced to live in? Right? Mm -hmm. So I don't know, I think there's, it, it opens up a lot more questions for me. And so those are the themes that I'm sort of interested in exploring. Mm -hmm. The global community as, as as that's just one of the pillars you know it, it doesn't matter what we explore on the other side if we're not bringing corporates and governments along with us in this conversation yeah nothing can happen unless we and then the, the bottom-up community piece of it which you know mm -hmm. you unleashing that, that that energy and innovation piece of it which I know you're intimately involved with and I think that's that's me where the real magic could happen because if you can align the other two and then you have the innovation happening in a way that is driving the kind of um, intentional narrative you want to see in the world and in, mm -hmm. in the areas that you think are that are aligning with a value system we all feel is important then we can create a system a different kind of a, a world with different priorities.
Yeah, I mean, we're, we're thinking about what is the blueprint for the new normal in the future? You know, what, what are the components that, that were there before? Which ones are, have been radically changed? How did they change? Um, what are behaviors going to look like? I mean, for example, just looking at um, cars, <laughs> you know, I mean, cars on the road, emissions. You know, this, one of silver lining is, of course, the emissions have gone down dramatically. Gas prices have gone. I mean, who would ever think that the gas prices would be uh, negative per barrel? Um, so it's, uh, it's shocking with some, some of the things that have happened and the new stimuli that it's going to have to come along to continue to make it happen. And then, you know, how does that really transform our lives and our, our organizations, our communities, everything in the future at every level? <laughs> Um, so, you know, in, in the future, one of the areas that we have been focused on in kind of the new normal is this big issue around communication of lots of different messages that are very confusing to people. And um, it's the, kind of the single source of truth. Where do you find and how do you create the single source of truth in the world? Um, where there's all kinds of different messages going on right now. And you know, it really takes strong leadership to do that. And one of the things that you're talking about was, and you you focus on is uh, leadership at a time of crisis. You mentioned, um, you know, how do you how do you think leadership is going to change in order to construct and strategize the new normal going forward? Yeah. Well. Yeah, I don't know that there's a new normal going for, but I do think humanity is just a set of stories we tell ourselves, no matter what, right? Mm -hmm. So whether it's religion or whether it's, you know, anything in life, our economic system, it's a story we made up and somehow it's a story we got a lot of people to buy into. And so we are very much in charge of retelling the stories we want to tell, right? Yeah. And so I think how we think about our future and how we live with each other in a tolerant way on the planet, most certainly at the end of the day, comes back to courageous leadership, but it also comes back to the stories we want to live with and the, mm -hmm. the kind of world we want to see. And mm -hmm. we've sort of become yeah. trapped in our own stories right now. We're in this sort mm -hmm. of endless loop. And the problem <laughs> with the stories we tell each other also is that social media can become a source of a single story that isn't a true story. And we've seen right. a lot of examples of that, right? With Cambridge Analytica, we've seen all yeah. sorts of ways social media has kind of propagated lies with single st stories that are not true stories. And so mm -hmm. I think we have to, as leaders, firstly, we have to teach students, you know, how to analyze, we have to teach the whole of humanity how to analyze what they're reading and where it comes from and what, you know, what the origin is. Mm -hmm. And secondly, we also have to think about, you know, we are a great storyteller. The most, the people that I know that have been the most successful in life are those that are amazing storytellers and they're mm -hmm. passionate about the stories they're telling, whatever those stories may be. Mm -hmm. And so what we need to think about is what are the stories that aren't working for us to live as human beings in a way that's, um, you know, compassionate and um, fair. And then how do we create new stories that people would be excited to live with? And then how do we... Because otherwise, right now we very much trapped in a bubble of consumerism and, you know, um, nationalism and everything that sort of sets us apart from one another and, and and I think we've also lost the ability to listen to one another so hmm. we, we are you know putting forward these stories in the world that are a single story in our own bubbles and we've lost the ability to respectfully listen to one another in a way that even if we don't agree is sort of honest and courageous and and allows us to at least try to see things from other people's hmm. perspective. Hmm. I think leaders of the future are going to be the people who are able to do that and able to um, work with, um, you know, their employees to help them understand why that's important, but also educate them on, you know, the, the dangers of that concept of um, a single, you know, story and, and, and the power of digital technology to 
put false stories, you know, into the world. And so mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done around that. So can you maybe uh, talk a little bit more about why you think the there's this problem with listening? I think you froze and I'm not sure. Can you hear me? Oh, there you I can go. hear you. Yeah. yeah. So, so why I think there's a problem with listening. I think, you know, everybody right now is being Ed, social media in a way that helps to propagate the aspect of is it's the, the social media just helps reinforce those truths and so and so this is the mainstream media i mean if you look at fox news it's it's a single narrative right mm -hmm. and so there's it's not a fair and balanced narrative and and possibly you could say the same for some of the other media channels and news channels but fox tends to be the most extreme in their inability to actually balance other points of view. So if all you're doing all day is to watching one single narrative of one single truth and you're not allowing any kind of other perspective into your life, well, after a while, that is going to be your tr single truth. And so I know lots of families right now that are deeply split up because of where they get yeah. their, their media from and their, their, where it's, whether it's social media or mainstream media as a source of truth. And so they only know that one narrative and they're not willing to consider any other narratives. And so I think as humanity, we have to come back together and we have to say, okay, I, res I, I don't agree with your point of view. I'm willing to listen to your point of view. I respect it. And I can try to understand why you think that way. And I can even maybe respect that point of mm -hmm, view. Mm -hmm. But it's important for me to try to at least understand why you think that way. And I think from my perspective and the, the you know, people I interact with, I don't see that happening on a very, very frequently. Hmm. What, one of the things that we do is um, for all of our new startups and or our teams that are coming into our challenges is we give them a, a fluid intelligence test, which uh, actually allows us to see their openness score. And the openness score is the number one score that will determine whether or not this person's going to be a good entrepreneur or not. So this gets back to your, your point. You know, we don't want to, we need people in the, our, our, our startups must be extremely open, which means they're able to absorb information that's given to them, constructive criticism or tips or hints or, or suggestions about how they could refine what they're doing to, to um, or transform what they're doing in order to make it better. Um, so that's, you know, it's, it's critical that you have that perspective uh, for, for it, startups that don't have that, that won't, won't succeed. We found that over and over again. So I, I think we're, we're definitely aligned on that piece. I, I think that a lot of people are confused. So that because they, some of them are, are listening and they just, they don't know which one is true because you're hearing from, you know, large political players, completely different perspectives or maybe not political players, but, um, different experts around the world that are, that have different, uh, you know, a, a very a myriad of views that, that aren't aligned. And, um, and sometimes, like you said, lack of alignment is okay, as long as you understand the, the, for the, ra the rationale. Yeah. Um, I kind of, when you talk about the stories, um, you know, just makes me think of TEDx because that's a platform, you know, for, for stories. And, and now what you've done is again, bring that to the next level with BOMA Global. Um, yeah. to, to pull, really pull together the different stories um, to create thought leadership. Um, so, well, and know, I just want to go back to what you said about, um, you know, I, yeah. the important point about the young entrepreneurs is that they are also open enough and are educated in a way where they have a sense of what it means to lead in the future with regards to um, you know, everything from gender equality, because we know from all the research that if you have a company that has an equal amount of men and women, yeah. it's a more successful company, right? right? Going yeah. right up to a board level, yeah. you know, having one woman on the board, 
does nothing. You've got to have at least three women on your board in order for it to have any significant effect. Yeah. And that all the research shows that the more diversity you have inside of your team, the more successful you're going to be as an organization in the future. And most certainly the young people are going to demand it. So you will be an outdated, obsolete organization if, you, if you're not looking at some of these issues, right? And so I think for, and also that you have a responsibility to not only gender equality, but transparency and um, a value system and that it isn't just about profit for profit's sake, it's for you know, people profit and purpose. And so I think as young entrepreneurs, you know, who obviously want to be successful and make a lot of money, it's not an either or, it's an and, you know. And so I think that's the piece of the education right now that is missing and it's even missing from a lot of business schools. And that's some of the work that needs to be done. So if you were to envision the you know, kind of the three main pillars of work that should be done, what would they be? Three main pillars of work in general in the world? No, 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 no for the openness I mean, factor. Because yeah, we were talking about like the openness factor and, and you know, um, within a people... company, specifically within mm -hmm. a company. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think gender equality, it all starts with that. I think it's a big one. You know, I think mm -hmm. if we had a equal amount of men and women on every board, every leadership team, and in every company, mm -hmm. um, for me, it begins and ends there, to be honest. Like, I think the rest falls into line after that because you're bringing in a different set of values and, you know, you can go into, look, you know, how you balance your life, how you live your life. And if, if you have your organization is going to have to deal with a lot of different things if you have a gender equal workforce and it's going to make, um, it's going to just make it a more balanced um, world, both personally and professionally. I'm lucky I have a husband who, you know, is with me every step of the way throughout our careers. We've gone back and forth and doing things for the kids and, you know, taking care of the home and cooking and what have you. But not everybody is as fortunate as I am, and I respect that, right, as a woman. And so for some women, it's much more difficult to balance it. And if, the, if their companies aren't respectful of how hard it is, it's hard for them to balance their lives and be happy human beings. And at the end of the day, our systems should support a sense of um, family values and happiness. Mm -hmm. you know, not just, mm -hmm. I have to show up at work and I have to do my job, right? And so I think... Having a diverse workforce and a gender equal workforce will open up a lot of conversations in companies that aren't happening right now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and again, I've been fortunate for the most part either to be in positions where I've worked for some companies that are understanding, but I've also been, I've usually been okay with, with in that environment having a voice. Um, to some degree when I was younger, not, but most certainly in the last 10 years, right? And if I look back on how I dealt with it when I was 30 versus how I dealt with it now, um, it would be very different. And if I wasn't in a supportive environment, um, it would be impossible. Mm -hmm. So I, to me, it all comes back to how do we create an environment that helps us balance our personal and professional lives. Mm -hmm. and is driven by how do we create a, a workforce that it has some level of gender equality in it. Mm -hmm. I, I, shared the, I share the same um, experience as you. <laughs> you know, I think at Goldman, when I started at Goldman, I was the only woman on the list of stock block desk. I was, I was a pretty much, I was at one out of three in the whole floor of the sales trading desk. <laughs> and when I went down to the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, I was the only one who was an analyst, you know, that worked for Goldman that was a woman. So it's uh, very interesting how these, uh, the dynamics change. And they were like, they, oh, it's, it's pretty funny. I have some good stories about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and look, we're living in a different time and place and things yeah. have improved. But things, you know, Melinda Gates says it's going to take 220 something years to get to gender equality. 
I don't, I don't believe we need 220 years. I think any organization could do it today if there's the will. There is just no reason why it shouldn't happen. Yeah. And I know, I do know that, you know, many use the excuse, well, they can't find enough smart women to put on their boards. I don't believe that for a minute. And so yeah. I think <laughs> it's more a sense of if you have the will to do it, you can do it, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, Manuel Tebet, you know, the head of Dallin decided he was going to, you know, create this, this workplace that is balanced and he did it right it's a matter of just making the effort mm -hmm. um, a lot of the nordic countries you know have definitely they are you know countries we can turn to they've led by example and um, they've used quotas at times um, do we need quotas potentially to get us there right but it all goes back to that's that is a controversial conversation it all goes back to our value system right if we're going to be honest with ourselves for women to really be equal yes maybe like anything else like apartheid you know we had to have a we had to have a certain amount of affirmative action to make it a, a fair society right so yeah um those are the kinds of conversations we are going to need to have you know laura we're, we're very fortunate in our um, startup challenges having launched more than 300 companies we have um, more than 60% of our companies are co-founded by women. And, um, and, and uh, it's, we, by natural occurrence, 80% are co-founded by minorities. So um, we're, we're, we're pulling in the both sides, of, both sides. We find that the startups that actually are more diverse are more successful, just, just based on a pure example. It's amazing. Of, yeah, yeah. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. you. Yeah. Because, I mean, we've startups. talked about I've been, I've been raising money now for BOMA. And honestly, you know, the data isn't good. You know, firstly, 95% of CEOs are men. Secondly, yep. pattern recognition. Thirdly, only 3% of money raised goes to women owned and run companies. So, yes, yes. Like that's just a depressing statistic. I know that. And then, and then the, the failure rates are also higher for, you know, the women led startups. And I mean, it goes on and on. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, what, what, you know, there's been a lot of silver linings from this COVID, you know, what, what do you say are some of the biggest ones you've, you've unearthed from your uh, communities around the world? Well, it's more from, I think, my own personal um, moment. I think that, you know, it's, it's allowed me to spend a lot, like slow down and not run around, you know, the world in New York City you know, like a, you know, like, like I was, and, you know, I've, I'm in a place where I can spend a lot of quality time with my family, and especially my two graduating seniors, which has definitely been a silver lining that I, I did not expect. I'm not sure they'd agree with me as much um, <laughs> as I look over to one of them. But I think it's been a nice time for us to be together as a family, um, even though it's come with a fair amount of stress with, you know, a startup and having to pivot and the global community. Um, from the global community's point of view, I, you know, I, what it's, I'm on the board of Equality Now, which is an organization that works with women around the world through governance and, and, and laws around how do you change laws around really the hard issues like sex trafficking. And, mm. um, and so I've got a lot of different inputs, but I think what COVID's really done is made me understand in moments like this, not that I didn't understand having grown up in South Africa, but how there's a big difference between how the haves and have nots are able to um, cope with a moment like this and how, how it makes the society even more um, divided and bifurcated based on the fact that people that have nothing really have no, no safety net right now. And so it's no longer just about, oh, I'm not going to be able to get my Amazon order, right? It's more about I'm, my kids are going to starve. And, yeah. you know, my husband, the alcoholic came home is constantly beating me up and my children and they have no way to go to school and they have no way at all to learn right now. And so there's, you know, it's, it's really difficult to watch how the one that I see, you know, some of the people in my kids families communities who this has barely touched in some ways you know and then on the other hand how you know there's a whole 
global community of people out there who are not going to survive this moment for all sorts of reasons. And, yeah. um, you know, I don't know that for them there is a silver lining, to be honest. Mm. If you're living in a shack with 10 people on top of each other and you're not allowed to leave your shack and you have nowhere to get food, there's no, you know, fresh direct or whole foods down the road. That's, the shelves are still packed. Mm. So uh, it's, it's, it's put into stark relief the growing divide, which we were all conscious of as one mm. of our humanity's failures between the haves and the have nots. Yeah, it really has. Um, you know, one thing that we have seen at least is that there's a lot of creation going on. Um, you know, new creative approaches. What we have had our pit, our startups pitching, you know, they pitch, they, re they do have these hot seats, right? So a lot of them have pivoted to see how they could help you know, transform what they're doing before to what could help. And uh, through a lot of giving, you know, the, the generosity, um, gratefulness, you know, some of those qualities have come out. And you, you, you mentioned it before, um, how do you humanize um, the, any situation? You said people, profit, and purpose. And every time you say the word people, I think about making things human. I think the people are actually are possibly more aware now that of, of the human nature, <laughs> really. And, um, you know, another thing we've seen is, um, you know, the, I mean, the, the, the quality of the air and the, I have never seen the trees so green in my life. That's mm -hmm. a, it's quite amazing. And, you know, also I think there's a lot of room for disruption of certain industries that, that have not changed forever. Like you were talking about schools and, you know, gyms. And I think that I'm working on this gym concept about like how do you change the entire way you experience a gym? How do you make it more efficient? How do you make it um, full circle, you know, so that you work out and then you also recover? It might make seem like a little thing, but it could make a dramatic impact on somebody's health, their life. Because, you know, even if you're very successful, but you don't, you don't take care of your body, you could die early, right? So I think there's, we, we've seen a lot on the, on the positive side, we've seen a lot of the creation, but we have seen that divide as well, especially in downtown DC. One of the guys on our, my team is, is there and he's like, well, you know, the people who are, are begging for money, they don't have anybody to beg for because there's no one around. So it's really caused some major problems. Um, well, I guess the one other silver lining that I sort of feel like, I'm not sure it's that obvious, but I do feel it is, you know, I, in America, I do feel there was a bit of a disregard for the last several years um, towards science and the truth of science, especially when it comes to global warming. And mm. so mm -hmm. what I think is quite interesting about this moment is, you know, with church synagogues and mosques having to shut down mm -hmm. and people having to listen to a single source of truth, which is, is, the, is the scientists around this. Yep. But I'm hoping there'll be a move back to a, a different kind of respect for science, right? Mm -hmm. When it comes to the environment and global warming and that it's, there are some hard facts and mm -hmm. just creating a, a different story because you don't like the hard facts really is not going to solve our problems in the long run. So I think that's sort of an interesting silver lining. Yes. <laughs> so, um, I guess, you know, what would you say, I have a couple more questions for you. Um, you know, I noticed you have the, 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 the BOMA club. What is it like to be part of that BOMA club? So BOMA club is created on a city by city level and it's really a CEO's club with, and entrepreneurs. So, you know, of the clubs we have right now, I think it's about 70% C-suite and about 30% entrepreneurs mm -hmm. and they, you know, in a world pre COVID world, they were getting together in person once a month and tackling some of these big questions as a smaller group, um, as well as a, a global group um, connecting the different cities. Um, in a COVID world, we've moved that online and to be quite honest, we've just relaunched it online. So okay. doing a lot of work around how do we meaningfully convene 
you know, CEOs and, you know, high level leaders um, and as well as entrepreneurs in a way that's meaningful to, to have some of these discussions that we've been mm -hmm. having. Mm -hmm. Okay, is it invitation only or how does it work? Um, it's invitation only right now, but you know, we, anybody is interested in joining, they can email me. Okay, great. So uh, if you were to give one, if the, the listeners here, the final call to action, you know, what, what should we be thinking about going forward? What would that be? So I think COVID has definitely given us this moment where we can step back and look at some of the failures of our current systems and think about how we'd like to innovate and design a better future and a fairer future for us all. And I, I, it's important to remember all our big problems are interconnected. We need to solve them from both a deeply local and global perspective and no one country can solve all these big problems on their own mm -mm. so we need different kinds of decentralized collaborations in order to do this um mm -hmm. in terms of listening to science um and thinking about it's not it's not an either or it's, you can you can care about and have and be nationalistic but also care about your your you know your your global brethren it's not an mm -hmm. either conversation mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. our politicians would like us to believe um, and then anybody can be a leader you know I'm not I, I wasn't born a leader you know I think leaders you choose to bring your values into the world and you step into a leadership position because you care enough about bringing those values into the world so anybody mm -hmm. anybody can become a leader you have to just choose to do it and it's it's up to you to step in and and then finally, I guess nothing's predetermined. I yes. think <laughs> yeah. a lot of things are not what we expected and nothing is predetermined around how they turn out. And it's really up to all of us to step up and figure out that piece. Yes, that's true. So just, uh, just as an FYI, we're, we're launching a children's health challenge. You know, there's been a big, big problem with developing drugs and diagnostics for children's health. And so as a result, Lots of children are treated with uh, adult drugs, which, you know, off label and they die and um, horrible things happen. So we're really hoping to drive forward that segment of the market um, this year, too. I mean, it's one small slice, but you know, there's, there's these different steps. Children's health is a big issue. So um, is there anything else you'd like to leave the listeners with today? I mean, we are living in an incredible time where anybody can innovate. So I know your audience is predominantly <laughs> entrepreneurs and I think it is an, a really exciting time to be an entrepreneur. And so I want to give everybody, um, you know, the support to say, just go ahead and, you know, do it <laughs> do, you do and do it. And, um, you know, all you can do is fail and which is okay to fail because you learn a lot from your failures mm -hmm. and, you know, make sure that whatever you're creating always represents the values you want to see in the world. Very good. Well, Laura, it's been a sincere pleasure to have you on the show. I really, really appreciate it. You have provided very valuable insights, but not just valuable insights, a lot of inspiration for, for, right. for everybody here. So I'm very, very grateful. And uh, we will be watching you and supporting your events and initiatives and your community and, and the club. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, um, if anyone wants to get in touch with you, how would you like them to get in touch? Um, they can email me at uh, laura at burma.global. Okay, perfect. All right. Thank you so much, Laura. You have a great day. Take care. Bye.